So I would then move on to the to uh, Dr. Mordecai, Mordecai Ogada, who, has, who is now with, with us via electronic means. It would be nice to have you here, but we will have to do the way we, the way we can. So Mordecai is a carnivore ecologist and conservation writer who has been involved in conservation policy and practice for the last 18 years in Kenya and other parts of Africa, mainly on human wildlife conflict conflict mitigation and carnivore conservation. Dr. Ogoda's professional work has included research and teaching conservation leadership at Colorado State University. Much of his energy has been devoted to the area of community-based conservation, wildlife policy, policy and wetlands ecology. So uh, with this, I open the floor for, for you, uh, Dr. Ogada. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll just set up my my presentation. Okay, um, quickly to, to take you through this uh, presentation about conservation areas, which are the new colonies in Africa, if we can describe them that way. Um, conservation areas, they, they were never an indigenous African idea. We never had habitat that was set aside for wildlife and habitat that was set aside to be used by human beings. But this idea came from the United States. Most, uh, so most uh, I can attribute it most to, to Theodore Roosevelt, who came up with this idea of keeping certain areas of pristine nature, the myth of pristine nature, that uh, means nature at its ideal has to be in a place where human beings don't live. And with that, they created the yeah, Stone, Yosemite, and various other national parks in the United States. The, the whole world then followed this lead, although Roosevelt himself was someone who had no knowledge whatsoever about ecology or conservation and all this. He was just, this was just a, a dream of his. 1909, Roosevelt did a famous safari to Africa sponsored by the Smithsonian Institution. He collected, or I should say killed, around 11,000 specimens of various animals. This safari actually occurred in Kenya, where I come from. And, and he's always been famous for this, and these specimens are still displayed in various museums in the United States and other parts of the world. And in, in actually in 2009, the Smithsonian celebrated a centenary of this although um, you cannot really be sure what it was they were celebrating other than what you can see is just um, slaughter of wildlife. So there, there were 5,013 mammals, but there were lots of birds, reptiles, etc., etc. Now fast forward, this is a photograph from Kenya, 1961. There are, there are some local people, uh, quote unquote poachers who are now under arrest because they were found um, drying and smoking some meat from, it looks like a gazelle, go and eat. Uh, so they have been arrested by the ranger you can see on the right there. At the same time, in 1961, Kenya, the Kenya Wildlife Department was actually exporting these, these elephant feet you can see there. They were killing elephants and exporting the feet to be used as waste paper baskets or to, as a stand for putting your umbrella or something behind the door. And, and they were doing this at, at the same time as they were arresting those who are killing wildlife, some small wild animals for food. So this, this shows the separation, the separation in wildlife policy and the way law enforcement was done between the races started quite early in Africa. And even with reference to the previous talk, it's amazing how little has changed over the last 80, 100 years. 1961, again, this is, this is uh, Nairobi. Um, there's a ta taxidermy shops and tourists would come and hunt. You can see leopards, um, you can see sable antelope, um, kudu, hirola, various species. And this was part of tourism then until 1977 when we stopped. But at this time, always, it was the wealthy, the wealthy tourist could uh, hunt for recreation while locals who might be hunting to eat something would always be arrested and prosecuted, occasionally even shot. 
Now back to Roosevelt Safari, 1909. You can imagine going across the plains of Kenya, thousands, uh, thousands of kilometers. And this is how they did it. His, his vast equipment and, and um, materials were carried across the plains by porters. Which, which this was sort of indentured labor. This was not voluntary. So these these people were coerced or forced in some other way into doing this, because that's how that's how um, that's how it worked back then in the colonial days, and and this this has been romanticized. The black African serving the white tourist, uh, or or the white person, whether in reference to wildlife, the white person is is still considered to be the authority, the one to be respected, the one to be served. And it's still very much romanticized, even the tourist industry today. So this subjugation that comes through wildlife or safari tourism started with Roosevelt and it still comes through today. Um, when we, it's, it's something from the days of explorers. We had explorers like John Speak, who is credited with the quote unquote, discovering various uh, features in Uganda and other places. In, in the 19th century, while being carried on the backs or on the shoulders of lo some local people. If you come to Uganda today, you still see tourists going to view gorillas being carried on the, on the shoulders of, uh, of some local people, some local employees. And so th this shows that the, the attitudes that were, were formed back then have only transformed in terms of it's, much, it's a much better like you see there, it's a much better structure, comfortable for the tourists to be carried. The tourists actually wearing very nice hiking boots, which you have not used to hike. And various little modern details have changed, but the, the concepts are very much the same. And this is the challenge we, this is the challenge we must confront. And it's, it, can only be, it can only be confronted properly by bringing of anthropologists, historians, and all these other the humanities into the conservation sphere. I think this this has been a huge step, which which is very recent, to bring the humanities into conservation because they sort of open our eyes to what has the things that have been wrong for, for many decades or centuries. Um, if you look at conservation, the fascination with African wildlife, um, with with um, visitors from the West, was about conquest. Um, shot the biggest elephant, shot the biggest hippo. Um, so conquest of the land, it was an avatar for conquest of the land. If you shot the biggest elephant in Kenya, it would be an avatar for you being the greatest person in Kenya, or that kind of thing. That's why we had this sort of, uh, with, the, with the huge magnificent trophies like this, we had always this kind of poses. The guy in the middle there and his sort of subordinates around him holding the tasks and framing them in that manner. It's a very common practice late, late uh, early to late 19th century in colonial Africa, particularly Kenya. Um, fast forward, this is 2018. That's, that's Richard Leakey, who was then the chairman of the board of Kenya Wildlife Service. We are still doing this ridiculous poses in the 21st century. So this is a mentality that's pervasive in the conservation world, not just in Kenya, but much of Africa, that the white person has to be, has to be at the helm, has to be glorified. The people standing there are members of the board of Kenya Wildlife Service. They're not certainly not his subordinates, but they feel the need to frame him in this manner because that's, that's the norm. It's abnormal in other fields of study or, or professional field, but in conservation, the the idea that white people are right, especially in Africa, is the norm. And when you when you point it out or speak against it, it's sort of it's 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 more unusual than you, it's more unusual than uh, than uh, acceptable. So back then, colonialism, the imperial approach. This is a this is a painting of the, the famous Berlin Conference. I think it was in the eighteen seventies where a group of European nations, a group of white men gathered around the table in Europe to divide up Africa and its resources amongst themselves. And this was a, pre this was a precursor to the sort of the, the colonial empires and exploitation, et cetera. So it was very clear what this meeting was about. Um, if we move now to conservation, we have 
what is most threatening now is the neoliberal approach. And the neoliberal approach is the approach where money, conservation is, is seen as an investment. There's money brought into conservation and all, sometimes it's called investments, it's called donor grants, it's called all sorts of uh, dif different terms, but it's, it's money coming in to monetize nature. You have, you have, I'm sure those of you in the conservation field have heard a lot about um, valuation of ecosystem services, valuation of wildlife, and this kind of thing. And this this meeting here is um, this is the called the Coalition for Private Investment in Conservation, and they met at Rockefeller Plaza. This was the first meeting was in 2017, and this is large. This is largely the group there again. They're talking about Africa, but you don't see many Africans there. The only difference with the other one is, is that maybe at least there are a few women and all that. So that's changed a bit over the years, but you don't generally don't see African present representation there. Yet they are talking about how it, they will divide up conservation areas in Africa. Um, this is just a slide showing some of the, the organizations involved. Obviously, there are there are some conservation organizations, but I'd like to draw your attention to the number of financial institutions involved. Credit Suisse, Finance in Motion, um, uh, Nature Vest, the Cornell, the, the Cornell Business School, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of finance, financial, um, financial uh, institutions involved in this. And this is a worrying thing because once you bring Capitalism is the reason for the decline in natural resources and the, the problems facing the world today. It's, it's, a, it's a cognitive dissonance to imagine that capitalism can be the source of saving what we need to save. You can see European investment bank. There's more than there again, again, um, Yale Center for Business, GF Impact Capitalist, and this kind of thing. So this is the worrying thing. This is the biggest threat wildlife today it's not it's it's big it's bigger it's bigger than um it's bigger than the threat from from poaching or illegal hunting and those kinds the monetization of nature whenever something is worth a lot of money it is human nature to over exploit it the question of race which was well, has been well covered in the previous presentation um it's still very real today and and it's very much my experience um as a, as a black african conservation scientists. Um, it's, it's, something, it's something I've lived, but we have, to, we have to address it directly. And that's why it's important to bring in non-scientists because um, if scientists have this habit of, of saying, can you give us the data? When you say there's a problem, you say, can you give us the data? And some of these problems are more qualitative than quantitative and they need qualitative mind to examine them. If you look at, if you look at the issue of protected areas, a lot of it is drawn from this ludicrous theory by Edward Wilson, the half earth theory that basically says half the earth should be conserved for biodiversity. Um, and that, that, is, that is not used by humans. And it, it uh, completely denies the, the, the truth we know that humans are part of nature. In East Africa, where I come from, it's considered the cradle of mankind. Mankind originated in East Africa. So in Kenya, human beings, one form or another, have been in the landscape for hundreds of thousands of years. So in 2021, we can't start seeing that they need to be removed, but science says this. So it's actually gotten some traction, and there's a half earth project. You can check this up online. And the worrying thing is that the half the earth that they want to conserve, if you're looking to conserve biodiversity, you're not going to concentrate on the North Europe, the temperate zones. It's all going to be tropical Africa, tropical Asia, tropical South America, because that's where the biodiversity is. And unfortunately for us, that's also where we live. So what are we going to do? Um, this is a quote from Prince William, who said that development in Africa is putting pressure on, or putting, and population is putting pressure on wildlife and habitat. He said this in, in 2018. So cultivation and all this are good things, but will have a terrible impact until we begin we plan and take measures now. So he's talking about basically limiting population. 
in Africa. He's not said anything about population of the UK or his three kids or, or population of any other place. It's about Africa. And it's about population of non-white people. Because the same similar arguments are used about other places like South, Southeast Asia and South America as well. And we have to face this. That's, that's why we need, we need anthrop the anthropological minds getting into conservation. Um, 2018 human population estimates, you can see China 1.41 billion, India 1.34 billion, Africa is 1.25 billion. To put this in perspective, that's India inside Africa and China inside Africa. Yet in, 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 um, in media, you do not see human population in China being referred to as a threat to the population. But you keep hearing about population of people in Africa is a threat to elephants, is a threat to lions, a threat to this and that, that and the other. We have to look into why, why this is accepted when it's so such obvious prejudice. Again, Prince William, because he is nobility is a good is a good representation of the problem that we have right now. It's not just him, but nobility elites are the ones who drive a lot of this prejudice because to them wildlife is a self-actualization. So he, he justifies trophy hunting, but at the same time speaks up against poaching. And what's the difference between an animal that dies because it was trophy hunted and an animal that dies because it was poached or taken for some other purpose? It's still a dead buffalo or whatever it is. And we still see this in media. Such photos are glorified. Well, such photos are called a tragedy. It's still a dead elephant. This one was killed in a conflict incident where I work, and you can see the tusks are still there. But it's still considered when a black person, when an animal dies with, at the hand of, in Africa, at the hand of a black person, it's considered a tragedy. It's a considered crime and should be, should be punished, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The other one is celebrated as well. So we, we have people like this. I'm sure you've seen lots of photos like this called sportsmen. And people like this are called poachers, even though they're, they're going to eat every little bit of that little diker they've killed. But they're, they're referred to as poachers, often shot on sight, um, often arrested, beaten, tortured in various different ways. Yet what they're doing is not new. We have to face the fact that there is a level of use of wildlife that is actually sustainable when it's used like this. But when it's killed for fun, human beings never have it enough. If you look keenly on this photo, you will see that there's a black man who's been told to hide his face somewhere behind the buffalo. This is a snapshot of what the conservation scene is in Africa. Black, black voices, black faces, black identity needs to be hidden, especially in the, in the technical fields of expertise. And, and you can search them out. You can, you can search them out in terms of authors of papers, et cetera. And I think, I've, I've experienced this directly as, as a person, and I think the, the pinnacle for me was when a paper being written at Oxford uh, World Carnival Research Unit, a paper on lack of diversity in carnival ecologists in Africa. They did not accept my views in that paper, yet I was the only black person, and the paper was about lack of black people in carnivore ecology in Africa. And, and, and that's, that's, that's the attitude, um, because they, they, they were not comfortable with the views I gave. They wanted my name to be part of the author, authorship, to give some credibility to the paper, but they did not actually want my views in there. And they, this is a big challenge today. You see photos like that, these are some Maasai herdsmen grazing the animals and there are some zebras there. They call this habitat encroachment. And they, they say the Maasai guy there they, is treated like he's a problem. But if you see this photo, it's called a riding safari. The difference is that one is a black man with some cows and this is some white people with horses. But the zebras, are, to, to them, it's, it's, it's all the same. It's human prejudice that's coming in and, and it masks the reality of conservation today. Um, I did some work in India. So this, this, this divide is, is, is there across continents. It's a bit more subtle in India um, because it's complicated by the caste system, et cetera, that are characteristic of that country. 
this was a cartoon about forest recruitment produced by International Fund for Animal Welfare. And if you look closely, you can see the forest guards are light, light skinned, light complexion, but the so called culprits are darker skinned. So the racism, the racism and, uh, and uh, prejudice that, that attends conservation in the global south is, is very real. And, and it's become, I think the greatest danger is that it's become normalized so that people don't see it as a problem. The role of corporate interests. Sorry. This is a, a president signing, signing a document, um, a document to conserve, quote unquote, conserve elephants. The gentleman in the dark suit behind him is the director of an organization called Space for Giants. You can check it out online. The guy in the light jacket at the left is Yevgeny Lebedev, a Russian oligarch who sponsors Space for Giants. And once you sign this agreement, you join something called the Giants Club. I'm, I'm not sure you can read this, but the Giants Club gives access to, the circle on the left says they give you access to heads of state. So if you give some money to Space for Giants, you say you've given money to conserve elephants, you get access to heads of state where elephants are, and then you can go there and get your contracts and all these other things. So it's one life is becoming an avatar for other things. So the new threats are elitism, racial prejudice, the new liberal approach, exclusion, militarization, violence in conservation, rights violations, and accession of lands and resources and fractal cultures and societies. I'd just like to illustrate what the nature conservancy, which is probably the worst example of this, of this problem is doing in Africa. There's that land around, the, that seascape around the Seychelles. Um, the nature conservancy has basically annexed 210,000 square kilometers around the Seychelles. And this is by paying a $20 million sovereign debt loan owed by the Seychelles to various donors, which is a pretty small amount of money considering this. Um, so they handed over control of these 210,000 square kilometers to the nature conservancy, which has to be consulted by anyone wanting to, to, to do oil exploration, shipping, or whatever through that area is controlled by this new power. Um, if you do the math, 20 million for 210,000 square kilometers comes to only $7.32 rental per square kilometer per year, which is a pathetic amount. So this is just exploitative business. And this is colonialism that's happening right now. And the indigenous commerce life and livelihoods, and there's this quote, which was in the Financial Times, you know you succeed when all the stakeholders leave a little bit unhappy. That was the, the TN's Nature Conservancy Director of Conservation Finance. So this thing is happening in plain sight. Now, what's a protected area? According to the IUCN, is this clearly defined space recognized and protected or managed through legal or other effective means. The red part is my emphasis. The other effective means is the right violations, the killings, the, the, the torture, the beatings, et cetera. And it's accepted. This is the currently globally accepted um, definition. And if you look at, um, there was just the World Conservation Congress in Marseille, France last month, and the EU came up with this project called Nature Africa. Again, you can find it at that link at the bottom. And these are the protected areas they, are, they now want to finance across Africa. They don't have any plan for Asia, any plan for anywhere else. They only want Africa. And you see many of the, the protected areas, the, the green areas on the landscape, you can see these are the new colonies. As you can see, they go right across international boundaries between countries. And this, this, is, this is the threat to Africa, that we are being taken over by another different force that is not responsible to international conventions, that has not, does not have responsibility, does not have responsibility to, to the UN and other, other global bodies that countries have. So this is the danger now. And the, the EU is financing this. And this is a plan they just had this year. You no know, COP26 is coming up. And all this expansion of protected areas, like they want to expand it to 30% of land mass by 2030, it's going to concentrate on Africa, where we live. We are going to create what we call conservation refugees. And I'm not sure how the world is going to deal with that, but political scientists and the humanities have to come into it and, and really question these things. 
um, how does this go on? It goes, it's driven by lies, by and large. Conservation to practice today relies on the crisis narrative. This is a conservation organization called um, David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust in Kenya. And they said, they put out this noticing one African elephant is killed every 15 minutes. If you do the mathematics, this is not possible. We'd run out of elephants. And they've written there that at this rate, there will be no wild elephants in 2025. This 2021. We know there will be wild elephants in 2025. So this is a lie. But it's lies are accepted in conservation because they're thought to be for a good cause. And, and, and these lies always imply or say expressly that indigenous people are a problem to conservation. They always vilify indigenous people because one being killed every 15 minutes in Africa, it implies these are, these are Africans killing, killing elephants. That's the simple implication there. Yet the truth is different. The truth is that the UK is today is the world's number one trade in ivory, number one, followed by the United States, then followed by China. That's the CITES figures, the official CITES figures. So the UK that is telling us about elephant conservation has still not banned ivory trade today, yet Kenya banned it in 1979. Other countries banned it at different times. So we have to look at facts rather than lies, but the crisis narrative has done us a lot of harm. It is what's resulting in the formation of new colonies that are financed by capitalists, the financial institutions I told you about, they're financed by the super wealthy around the world, but they're not, they do not have the responsibility that sovereign governments have. And this is the danger because they will keep taking resources away and they're capturing resources on behalf of um, oil exploration and various extractive industries. They're capturing water sources, they're capturing carbon sequestration areas, and all these are being taken away from the people who have kept them intact for centuries, millennia, and since, since time immemorial, and, and uh, are now being ejected from what they, are kept, they have kept so well by the people who have destroyed other parts of the world. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge, um, thank you, Kunst Museum, Ben, for inviting me.